All right, here we are. Welcome, friends, to I have no clue what episode. I have no clue what season. I don't even think I know what day it is. I do know that daylight savings just happened and that it was dark and snowy on my way home. So I'm going to guesstimate it's between November and March here in Colorado. There you go. That's a fair assumption. Thanks. Uh, so today our topic is Chris is going to talk about some little green men and I don't mean the seven dwarfs. I don't think at least. Um, so I'm excited for that. Right. That's our topic. Or gremlins. Or the gremlins. Yeah, it depends. It depends on the story or it might just be a uh, animal. Oh, I love the animal. He's one of my favorite characters. Yeah. So, uh, to get us going, we'll do our wacky world news. Wait, any updates before we start? I mean, we're gonna we're gonna continue to put out. Where I know we haven't been as consistent as we hope to be, and we've strived to be in the episodes. It's just uh, life gets in the way, unfortunately. And you know, this is an extracurricular that the three of us love to do. And you know, it's a, a three man operation, or two one man, two women, or whatever a three person operation. And um, you know, we're trying to get it done and. And put it out there. We love doing it, but uh, sometimes life gets in the way, and we're gonna mm-hmm. still strive to keep kicking them out as fast as we can and decent episodes. So just bear with us and hang in there. Yeah. Hey, I have a good feeling. I think that moving forward, some of us are gonna have more time. It's winter yeah, now, so, so we're gonna be inside a little more. Yeah, yeah I think so. I feel good about this. All right. Here we go. So, and did you want me to do Wacky World News or did you want to do it? You can do it because it, it, was, it was a good one that you sent me today. Yeah. So today, uh, Chris, sorry, I didn't get to send it to your way. I just kind of thought it was funny and sent it to Ange while taking my afternoon poop. And <laughs> uh, the, what I found is Florida woman arrested for slapping boyfriend in the face with a taco. Wow. And Taco Bell replied with, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Are you serious? They really wrote that? Yeah. yeah. Really what they it were it was a with. screenshot she sent me. Yeah, yeah. It was great. It's hilarious. <laughs> and I will uh, share this on our Instagram for our listeners to see. So, yeah. So I did some digging. Uh, and then Ange, uh, the best as our producer, made sure that it was the right information. Um, but it is actually a story from... 2021 inch is that right or about a woman um, well the there's a couple I found was from 2016 okay so there's a couple there was a 2016 one which was i think a taco supreme yeah it was a burrito supreme a burrito oh, wow. supreme and then i think they actually struck again maybe a different person uh oh, nope. i think that was a husband um Because then there was another one of a woman arrested uh, for slapping her boyfriend in the face of the taco in 2019. So apparently this is how one is to go about. um, Oh, and then in 2023, we have a Florida woman who used a burrito as a weapon again. So this is how you really go about to let your partners know uh, where they stand. So. Was the most recent one again in Florida? Because the first two were. Yeah, in St. Pete. Oh, lovely. So we go from Pensacola to... Miami, I right? Where, I, I don't know where this one was. The second one. Okay. The 2019 so this one, one. The one in 2023. I'm sorry to cut you off. This is black. She did not uh, slap him with the burrito. She threw the burrito at him, and the article says that she didn't have the aim or the angle as her airborne Tex-Mix treat missed her target and hit a random person in the face. So they were out in public when that one happened. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So it was 46-year-old uh, lady named, we will not say, so 46-year-old woman and her 66-year-old boyfriend were facing an argument. And she uh, tried to. Oh, there's a picture. She tried did, to. Did throw I hear the you? Right? There was a 20 age difference. Yep. 
A 20 year age. Okay. I guess he wasn't listening. He didn't have his hearing aid on that day. Right. <laughs> so then she hit someone else in the face. Uh, doesn't say if they were injured or not. Cops arrived. Um, and then she was charged with disorderly conduct, which is a misdemeanor, and then booked at the county jail. So she's a financial advisor in Tampa. I just, oh, and so this is not her first offense. She also allegedly. Uh, was arrested for punching her 66-year-old boyfriend in the face during an argument. So it sounds like they might need some con- some counseling. Also, at what point could that be considered elderly abuse? Consider what? Elderly abuse. If there's a 20-year oh, age that's gap. That's a good question. That is an excellent question. question. Right? So my question, though, On top of that, what the hell are they making burritos out of in Florida (laughs) that they're considered weapons? What? (laughs) Because every burrito I've had from Taco Bell falls apart before I even get it to my mouth. Uh, Well, this one is actually the one I'm talking about now. It's a place called Rick's Reef, which is a St. Pete kind of burrito uh, eatery. But I agree. It is taco. I've even had tacos from like a classy taco place and I yes. usually can't like pick it and throw it. <laughs> like that's a, I, yeah, I mixed that up. I thought it was, it was just Taco Bell commenting on it. My fault, my fault. Yeah. Well, the one was, and I think there was an early one from said, Taco Bell. Yeah. Huh. Um, so according to the world health organization, anyone over the age of 65 is elderly. So it would be considered elderly abuse in a way. Like, I love to- I actually today had a tostita for lunch from a wonderful place called Polo Loco, which is a fast food oh, yeah. rush. Have you been there? Oh, so so good. Love it. So good. And I just can't imagine throwing any a taco at someone, not because I can't imagine being angry at someone to want to, but I'm not going to waste my taco. Agreed. Right. I just, I, I'm just trying to think in the moment, what would piss somebody off so much that you'd literally throw your food at somebody like, and it'd be such a consistent food too. not to, you know, I get people get upset and just throw whatever's right there, but it's consistently tacos for some reason. Is there something in tacos that's angering people? Maybe it's like the, um, like the salsa. I don't know. They, they mean, I get hot and bothered I when I eat a taco. So I was going to say tacos make me happy. So yeah, they make me happy and they make some people hot and bothered, but on the other end, not the top end. <laughs> yeah, I went there. <laughs> Do you know that I have a hard time eating fish tacos? It just creeps me out the name. Like I bet they're delicious, but I can't do it. They are. Fish taco- but the idea of fish tacos. Love, love, love fish tacos. That's really good for Robin. Yeah. Yeah, I went there. (laughs) Another really good taco is, um, is, uh, shit. What is that place called? I love the shrimpy tacos. Franchise with, yes, the the shrimp tacos from, um, what's the fish place called? It's a chain with Outback. Bonefish. Bonefish, yeah. yeah. They have the Bang Bang shrimp tacos. Mm. Oh, I man. do like shrimp tacos. Have you ever had torchies? No, what's yes. that? Yes. I've had torchies with you. You have had torchies with It's Angela's. amazing. It's amazing. When you come to Colorado, you have to have it, Chris. They went right by us. Mm. And they have this, um, they have this taco. They have a lot of them. And they're like, it's like more of a Californian taco, like kind of street taco. You like eat a couple of them. Um, and one of them is called the Hillbilly. Uh-huh. And it's like fried chicken and you can get it in a corn shell or a flour shell. And it has like cheese and then it has like the cilantro ranch like and like fat, like um some, like I want to say jalapenos on it. But I get mine um extra trashy. Oh, what's that? So that puts queso on it oh. and this like really good, like that sauce. I was like the extra sauce on it. It's so good. It's it's pretty like delicious. 
And they also have a shrimp one like that I think you would like. It's like the Bing Bang one. That one's called What's the Baja called? shrimp. Torchies. Torchies. Like like a literal torch torchies? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think California. Oh, it's like a chain then. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oh, there's none out. Here. I don't think there's any on the East Coast for us. No, though. we just got them. Um, hmm. I don't know. You could go like Torchies, Torchies Origin Store. Mm-hmm. And then this other place. Oh, yeah. The, oh, I'm sorry. They're from Texas. From Austin. Oh. So, and then we have this other place that is really good that's called Illegal Pete's. And they're like Chipotle, but that is a Colorado only thing I think, and um, they're really good. Well, didn't Chipotle start in Colorado? I feel like it did. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Illegal Pete started in Boulder. Um, yeah, Chipotle started in uh, at DU University. Uh-huh. So we have a lot of pretty good. Like, I don't want to say we have a good. We have a lot of good Mexican places, but I think we have a lot of good like Tex Mex or like. California inspired. Although apparently all my friends from California are like, you gotta go to California to get really good tacos. Well, I feel like that's like crab cakes for Maryland. Mm-hmm. Like people have crab cakes elsewhere and they're like, oh, they're nothing like Maryland, which I can't give specifics, but I f- and I'm not a crab cake aficionado, but yeah. I've had crab cakes elsewhere that are really good. And yeah, they're not a Maryland crab cake, but they're still really good. And how could you really expect to have the food local to a place outside the place and it be really good. You know, I feel like exactly. that's hard to do. It's, it's not only the ingredients, you know, locally sourced or whatever it may be, but it's the know-how the seasoning mm-hmm. of the grill from cook or the, whatever, however they're cooking it, you know, cooking lots of it, you know, adds to it. It's a whole, whole bunch of, just of variables that add to it that I think people don't give stuff like that a fair shake, you know? Oh, I totally agree. When we were in Texas last year, um, we I wanted like pretty good. I was like, oh, I want Tex Mex, I want barbecue, like all the things Texas is known for. And we ended up eating uh Whataburger because Texas is known for a Whataburger. Whataburger <laughs> is so good though. It was good, yeah, super good. What is it? And then Whataburger. It's like a burger oh, wh- chain. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying water burger. Oh, okay. no. What a burger or what a burger. Um, and I had yeah. that before because we had one in Florida. I went to college. And then we ate somewhere else. Oh, shit. I can't think of what it's called. But I thought it was better than Whataburger. burger. And Adam and I, I am not. And they're like literally were like next to each other. Like there might have been a Starbucks in between. And Figures. I swear. And we, because we couldn't decide what was better. I cannot remember the name of this place. Um, we got the same thing almost from each and then had to like try it. And the best part well, is like, Adam's, it was so fun. Um, but Adam's uh, brother, I didn't, my sister, our sister-in-law was like, loved it. Cause she like loves burgers. Um, but my brother-in-law doesn't like eat that stuff. And so oh, I felt like we were just like bringing junk food in the house. And I was like, enjoy your <laughs> granola bars, Jeremy. Uh, we eat the Whataburger. I can't think of what it was called. I, mean, Texas, I miss in and out. I love in and out. And I know Maybe there's a, a mixed crowd with that, I think. But I, I do like in and out. And I, it's been you a long time. Whataburger, though. And compared I, yeah, to I never had it. Oh, yeah. Is it better? I think so. The patties are really? bigger. Yeah. Uh, I, that's good. And Whataburger has better fries. I feel like in and out fries are like really fake yeah. tasting in a way. There's something about in and out fries, and maybe it's because I've never had it super fresh because I've always had it brought home, cool. but they're always cold. No, they're not. They're straight, they're straight fries. Yeah, they're like Are you thinking of Shake Shack? Pie. Yeah. Shake Shack oh, is crinkled. And Shake Shack fries. I will write yes. stories about those. Yeah, those are very good. good. Yeah, they're, they're good. No, I, I don't know what I was thinking of. You know who else? Um, and I lost it. I was getting ready to say it, and I lost it. I mean, oh, that I don't like though, and I know is uh, White Castle. Not a fan. No, me neither. No, not a fan at all. I've had it in Vegas. I've had it in Jersey, and it's just to me, it just 
they're fun because of the size of them, but the taste is just like, oh, the onions, oh, yeah. how they cook yeah. the onions, oh, it's awful. But to each their own. And if you like White Castle, have two on me, but I just can't do it. <laughs> Honestly, I think my favorite is probably Shake Shack. Yes, I, I do like Shake Shack and I especially like their fries. I used to mm-hmm. treat myself um, when I worked for the hospital. Cause there was one not too far that uh, I think order up, you know, an order up and all those things just started. Mm-hmm. They give you like good deals and I would get deals all the time. Now they don't do that. Cause it's so like mainstream, but I would like once a month treat myself to Shake Shack and I would get a shake, a burger and a, and a fries. That's probably mm-hmm. how I gained a bunch of weight, but. It was really good. I, I miss it. I haven't had that. I haven't had Shake Shack in probably two, three once years. Once a easy. month? Once a month, though? That's not That's not going to do much yeah. for you. No, no. But it, it was like a guilty, unknown pleasure that I, like, I surely enjoyed. I trick myself because I act like, oh, well, I didn't get a bun. So I totally deserve a milkshake. Like, I mean, healthy. Yeah, but that bun saved you. Yeah. What? How many calories in that right. milkshake added? <laughs> like maybe a hundred calories. calories. That milkshake added like a thousand. Yeah. No, it, it's my favorite. though. I, it, the part that yeah. sucks is but we have hey, a torchies. I'm all about the, the mind trick though. We have a torchies. Gotta a love that girl, ma- girl math. Right. And a Raising Cane's all by, you ever had Raising Cane's? Yeah, they yeah. actually opened one in uh, Westminster. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I one in Crofton too. Oh, did they really? Wow. Yeah, Route 3 was a cluster. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, man. But that cane sauce. Mm. Adam doesn't like it. It's okay. I I love the fries and the sauce. I've only had it once. And they they were building the one in Westminster for like an easy two years. Like they started during COVID. I think they finished like maybe six months ago. Hmm. I feel like it was forever they were building that thing. Well, now that we've gone from tacos to burritos to tacos to chicken, burgers to chicken, uh, let's just end with we are not sponsored by any of these people. But if they want to sponsor us, we won't say no and uh, get to our main Absolutely. topic. And we know what Amanda's having for dinner. Uh, One I'm of those. Pot, I'm <laughs> pot roast for dinner. No. We, uh, we're long. trying to not eat out, which is good because um, we don't need to buy new pant sizes more. Um, and my mother is home, so she makes me dinner. Yes, so I'm and yeah. I did have schnitzel yesterday, Christopher. It was very good. Fantastic. Very good. I heard. I heard you were having it. I didn't know. Did she try the new way she was talking about? Um, she did for a little bit. So, and uh, Adam got this new cookbook that's all based on texture. So it's like making things based on different textures. It's yeah, interesting. And they had chisel I mean, in there. Some sometimes the texture of food steers me away from trying it. So yeah, yeah, I think that's like kind of the point of it. It's weird. Um, so there was a schnitzel recipe in it. So mom was like, "Oh, I'm gonna try it." So she said she tried like two of them, but it, she couldn't. It's she was didn't plan well, so she was trying to finish the the German potato salad, and it just like she's just too slow. So. She's like, it would work oh, if God. like you, if her and I were both doing it, because I could do the schnitzel like in just one person. So, or if she forgets there's crab cakes in the oven. Oh my god! Whoops. Yeah, when it, when Andrew's visiting, mom put crab cakes in the oven, and we're all sitting down eating. Because oh my god, the crab cake! And we have never seen her run that fast. Like she got up and ran. <laughs> Did they burn? <laughs> no, they were okay. They actually probably could have stayed in for a little longer, to be honest. Yeah, probably. Oh, wow. and then, like they could have stayed in for a couple more minutes. Yeah. So every time she was like slow, uh, Rob or Eric or Angie would be like, all right, Mark, I think it's crab cake time. Get her going. Crab cake el dente. Yeah. So it wasn't bad. But the schnitzel was good. It was, I did like that she, instead of just pounding the hell out of it, she like op- cut it, like butterfly it almost and made it bigger. That yeah, was that's really one good. thing I remember. That and then the cooking it. Piece by piece was like the two things I remember the the big difference of 
how we normally make it to how she was going to try making it. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was well, good awesome. though. You know, I'll eat it for the next couple of days. I love me some schnitzel. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to talking about the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, also known as the Hopkinsville Goblins case or Kelly Greenman case. So it was claimed a, a close encounter with extraterrestrial beings in 1955 near the communities of Kelly and Hopkinsville, Hopkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky. So before we go forward, just let you know that I did get my information from history.com and all that's interesting.com along with a little slice of Wikipedia for my references. <clears throat> so UFO just regarded as one of the most significant, well-documented cases in a history of UFO incidents. While skeptics say the reports were due to effects of excitement, and misidentification of now the alleged is incident as a hope, which we'll get more into that going forward. Psychologists have used the alleged incident as an academic example of pseudoscience to help students distinguish truth from fiction. So keep that in mind as we go through. So their story of a terrifying siege by otherworldly beings would become one of the most detailed and baffling accounts of alien close encounters on record, notably for the large number of witnesses. While visiting a friend named Elmer, Lucky Sutton, we're going to refer to him as Lucky, at uh, his farmhouse in the tiny town of Kelly on August 21st, 1955. Huh? We can't, we can't call him Elmer. Elmer. <laughs> Elmer Fudd. <laughs> Come on, Elmer. And he probably was a, he probably was an Elmer Fudd for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, go back to Lucky. So, uh, he was visiting a friend. I'm sorry. So Lucky's the friend that Billy Ray Taylor uh, went to visit in Kelly, Kentucky. So Billy God, Ray I Taylor these names. went outside at approximately 7 p.m. to collect some well water. Billy Ray had come from PA to visit Lucky with his 18-year-old wife. <clears throat> Lucky and Billy Ray had worked together um, at a traveling do they carnival. Tell us so how these old? are... <laughs> You know, I did. You know what? <laughs> Sorry, a traveling carnival. I didn't cut me off at my yes. feet with that one. <laughs> I was about ready to make fun of his eighteen-year-old wife, and then he said traveling carnival, and I was like, "Well, I know the answer to that. He's at least in his forties. Yeah, he he's older. I don't remember his exact age, but he is he is older than his Do wife. Do you think he met sure. his wife at the carnival? Because I had a sorority yes. sister that totally met a, her partner at the carnival. At the carnival, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly that it get, yeah further down they did meet at the at the carnival. Like the Glenburn carnival. Spoilers, calm down. Look, I love <laughs> a good carnival. When's the last time you've been to the carnival? Last year. The, um, and you literally like live in like right basically in Glen Burnie, and you have not been to the Glen Burnie Carnival. Way to go, you know, the last time, Ugh. You know the last time I went to the carnival was with you in high school. I don't. Wow. I don't actually know the last time I've been to a carnival, more or less the carnival, which is the carnival in our hometown. Um, but I. Feel like I need to make a visit this summer so I can people watch. Oh, yes, it's it's you know, definitely. To be honest, at any carnival, it's good people watching because even up here where I live, the carnival up here is it's unbelievable what it attracts. It's just but like, the only place that's that remotely here. close to bring a community of people such as carnival folk together is a Walmart. <laughs> and it's even better than a Walmart. I mean, it's you have the people that treat it as it's the uh, you know the event of the year to to show off their new threads, or you have the people that are like, yeah, I guess we'll go to the carnival, and they show up in stained sweatpants and a ripped t-shirt and a white. Uh, I mean, it's just or a white. Yeah, 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 and then. You have people, you know, the teeny boppers that are wearing stuff that's way too revealing for their age. 
it, it's it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. The the diversity of people that carnivals attract. So I don't know if we have carnivals here, but that's gonna be my summer mission next summer is to figure out all the carnivals and go to them. Is that because that's it's not an East Coast thing. I mean, there's carnivals all yeah. around, right? Uh, carnival clientele? Carnival? I think I haven't been back to one. Color. And I mean, I, oh. I blame Amanda. But I do. Because <laughs> when so, we went don't to the say, Don't you remember? Because we know I don't remember because no, I have no, the no, worst I, memory. No, you do not. I do. We both know this. Um, you tried to kill me on the zipper. I was I feared for my life on the zipper riding it with you, <laughs> and it was the first time I had ever been on the zipper. That's a, that's not even as bad. <laughs> I was gonna say, Inch, I do remember that, and that is a cakewalk compared to the zipper ride Christopher and I rode on. Oh, I bet, <laughs> but still, <laughs> life changing experience. I will say that. <laughs> so. We were at the state fair and Aunt Sherry, I think, gave each of us like $20 or something, which didn't get us yeah. back Because the carnival is fucking expensive now. And right. we were like, let's go on the zipper. And we get into the cart and we're just kind of swaying there. And I was like, Chris, I don't know how to tell you this, but my side of the cart is kept together with, with, uh, What's that? A duct tape. Duct tape. Zip tie. Yeah. Duct tape. Duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Duct tape and zip ties. I remember and Chris, that. And Chris, what did you say? <laughs> You're like, well, me, mine's uh, put together with zip ties. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was like the first time in my life I was like, I'm too old for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to die. And I was like, Absolutely. well, if we die, we die together. <laughs> Yeah, and somebody's going to be rich suing whatever that carnival's name is. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. That, and then we wrote the, like, jump. What's the Tron thing you get in and you, like, go upside down? You talking about the spinny thing? <laughs> yeah, what was that called? The cyclone the left- or something. Yeah, or something like I, that. I just remember, like, looking at you and being like, you're not feel And, like, the, like, little kids are, like, rolling all around. And I was like, yeah, it's their payment. <laughs> So, oh man, that good time. I forgot all about that. Uh, to answer your question, there is a winter carnival happening in February in Steamboat. Um, so I'm assuming it probably does not have roller coasters. Well, that can be a carnival. Like, I think you can call anything a carnival. I don't think it has to have a, like, a ride. I mean, no. you can probably like do the tilt whirl. It doesn't necessarily like have to have a roller coaster. Most carnivals don't really have a roller coaster. I meant, I meant like a ride. I don't think there's rides in the winter because you're not going to want to ride anything in February in the mountains. I mean, you could tilt a whirl. Wouldn't you be oh, cold? Sp- speaking of that, Glenwood Caverns, Amanda. Holy shit, right? I haven't heard anything about that in a while. Did you what did I miss? Angela? No. So, Real quick, everybody bear with us. This is an interesting story if you haven't heard. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase and butcher it and hopefully somebody will fact yeah. check me. So this guy ended up... Now, mind you, if you're not familiar with Glenwood Caverns, it's literally like a mountain or a plateau. And at the very top, you it, it's all like, a, like an amusement park. So there's rides. It's so and fun. It is a ton of fun. We, we went there when we um, went to Colorado. Uh, last year or whatever it was so to get up there normal people like visiting to get up there you have to ride like a gondola is it or what do they call that uh like yeah, the sea gondola. lift thing it's a gondola sure. sky, yeah a sky gondola. lift yeah whatever mm-hmm. yeah so it's a gondola there's you know of course there's a service road which we'll touch on in a second so you get up there and it's just all rides and there's caverns they call them like the fairy caverns or something like that you can go in a, you know go in there and they'll give you like a tour and tell you about it so this guy apparently w- drove up the service road at night, broke in, and he was armed to the teeth. He had explosives, improvised explosives. He had dummy explosives, guns and ammunition through his, you know, out of, like a ton of it. 
and he's wearing what they call tactical type clothing and insignia or patches on him that he would, you know, could look like a police officer or something like that. They found him dead in the women's restroom there. And it was written on the wall. I just want to see, or I just want to see the caverns or I just want to go to the caverns or something like that. And it, it, it's like, what was he going to do? Was he, you know? This and, happened recently. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. So what I'm thinking, and I'm going to butcher this too, which I've already butchered the first part of the story. So when you do the tour, the caverns, they talk first, about... It, the guy- said, it didn't say that. It said, I am not a killer, is what was written on the wall. I thought it said, I'm like that. And then it also said, I just want to see the caverns or something. No, that's not what the news says, at least. It just says caverns. that it says, I am not a killer. Which that, and then is... So fucking freaky. Also, I keep doing with my hand and it keeps. Yes. Me and that, yes, I was going to say. So that, that alone is creepy because, like, is this like a MK Ultra type thing gone haywire? Or, you know, why, why did he give up and decide not to? Well, and then they also, so they, he was highly weaponized. They found bombs that were uh, going to be de- detonated. Um, like, Basically all of that, and they've closed down the caverns indefinitely at the moment. So the explosives that have been brought up were that's pipe the bombs. craziest part. Is what like what? So the rest of the amusement park is open besides besides the caverns. No, it's all closed. All closed down indefinitely right now. Yeah, it says they're closed oh, for the season. Okay, okay. The lifts are closed. Yeah, so what? Well, it, it makes sense because right now you don't even want to drive through the canyon. Like it's pretty snowy um unless you're going to like aspen i guess but you'd probably go a different way um but it says that they found pipe bombs fake ieds a package with a real explosive device and fake grenades and see the caverns that was crazy about the caverns is i remember them telling a story about the guy that discovered the caverns and major a lot of it's not are undiscovered because in the way they used to have to get into the caverns they had to squeeze through like a ridiculous long amount where it was like nose to face to the sides of the cavern and they had like shimmy down between it to get down there and then do the same thing to get out. And it took like hours to do it. And that's where, how they were like, so no claustrophobia. If you're claustrophobic, you're screwed because you're, you're going to have a, you know, you're going to freak out. Yeah. That's a no for me. But I mean, now that, cause they blew a hole in, in it to, access it a different way it's it's you know there's stairs and everything else to get through there it's not tight at all anyway that was crazy little green men yeah i was and then it kind of went quiet like we haven't heard anything in the last like week or so which makes because it's been almost a week it makes me wonder if they're like the conspiracy theorist in me is like was this some mk ultra shit or like something like that they found it out and they like shut it down and that's the thing. And and I think the same thing with the Vegas shooter. Well, mm-hmm. Like, what happened with that? There's been no developments with that. Shut it yeah? down. Yep. So anyway, that's a that's a topic for another day. So back to the uh, Hopkinsville incident. So Billy Ray had come down from PA to visit Lucky with his wife, 18-year-old wife. Lucky and Billy Ray had worked together, of course, at the carnival, like we said. So Billy Ray was outside gathering some water and then he saw something streaking across the sky that caught his attention as he later recounted it came silently toward the house passed over it stopped in the air and then dropped straight to the ground taylor later described the silvery object as with an exhaust all the colors of the rainbow so that what is he like chasing a skittles ship or a, a or lucky charms i was thinking i was like this this tin can yeah, tin can, lucky charm thing floating across the sky. Like they must have been on some, there must be lead in the water and they're like tripping, you know what, to see. Like what the colors is what gets me. Like, what would be the purpose of that? If you're inventing a spaceship, wouldn't you find a way for it not to admit a bunch of colors? I feel like that's kind of an extra thing. Like, what would be the purpose of that? So that's one th- the story. It's kind of like, what the hell? So, he panicked and fled indoors and told the others about what he'd seen, um, which included his wife, the Sutton family, uh, which we'll get into the rest of some of the family. 
Taylor also recalled that he hadn't heard an explosion, just a hissing noise as the object landed somewhere behind the farmhouse. No one took Taylor ser- seriously, though, until the dogs began to bark. Someone or something was approaching the house. The Sutton's 50-year-old widow and matriarch, Lanny Lankford, her two older sons and their wives, a brother-in-law and the widow's three younger children, ages 12, 10, and 7, didn't take Billy Ray seriously and still laughing off the UFO account. An hour later, alerted by the dog's incessant barking, Lucky and Billy Ray went to the back door and made out a strange glow in the midst of which they spied a small humanoid creature. About three and a half feet tall, it had an oversized head, almost perfectly round, its arms extended almost to the ground, its hands had talons, and its oversized eyes glowed with a yellowish light. The body gave off an eerie shimmer in the light of the night's moon and they said as if it was made of silver metal terrified the two men grabbed 20 gauge shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle and fired at the little men its hands now raised as if it held up a gun as if it was held up a gunpoint as it came toward the back door they reported that it did a flip scrambled upright and fled into the darkness so when this thing was shot it basically you know, it's walking towards it with its hands up like this. It, it, you know, like a normal person walk. I know you can't, not everybody can see what I'm doing, but it's walking towards them with its hands up, basically saying like, friend, you know, friend, not foe, friend, not foe. It, they shoot it. It flips up in the air up to like horizontal with the ground and then floats off back towards where the rocket ship was at. Like what in the world, right? So they seriously were tripping this. some balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? Coyote moonshine, squirrel testicles. Were they smoking? Yeah, I don't. I have no clue. But it, it, that to me, the the details are what like get me. So shortly after, the men saw a similar creature appear in a side window and fired through the window screen. Still impervious to bullets, the little man again flipped, then disappeared. I went out in the hallway and crouched down next to Billy when I saw one approaching the door. Miss Langford told Isabel Davis, author of an extensive report called Close Encounters at Kelly, sorry, Close Encounter at Kelly and Others of 1955. Horrible title. Hard to say. Don't like it. It looked like a five gallon gasoline can with a head on top and small legs. It shimmered bright metal like on my refrigerator that was the uh description isabel day or uh miss lankford gave isabel davis so another description was drawn by the um so this is the description that was drawn by the investigators that was given by elmer all right so this is the description let me show you guys and we'll post these as to our uh, our Instagram, of course. I can't wait to see that gasoline can, or whatever you said. The mother said, "Yeah, well, she, this that's her description. This is this is Elmer's uh, description." I was going to say it better not be that first one. <laughs> so, oh, it, well, it's not this, guy, but that, so this is what they said, the one on the, the left here. So this is the description they gave. When I saw this thing, the first thing came to mind was this guy. You know, the guys, for those who are listening and not seeing what we're showing at the moment, the guys from Toy Story that are in the vending machine, the little alien guys. Yes. That's exactly what these things look the like. The claw. Yes, the claw. To me, that like the head specifically, the body's not the same because it's like Skinny and See, lanky. Or stitch. Yeah. With the yes. Face. Yes. Yes. But mind you, this is 1955. They have good muscle definition. Like, they, they must do. really work out. Look at out. those pecs. Well, I wonder what they do out. for a tricep workout. They can use a forearm workout. I know that. <laughs> yeah, right. And legs. Well, it doesn't look like they have any junk in the trunk, so they're not, you know. Nope. Or no drunk in the front. I don't 
Oh, they had talent. Talent? Yeah. Talent? No. How did they so show they they the webbing in between the too. fingers? Did they were they able to see the fingers that close to know that they were wet? Well, they weren't able to count the digits, so I don't know how they saw the webbing. Right. And it had no neck. I mean, I know some people who don't have a neck, so. <laughs> Actually, you probably so, know some people who look like this. They just skip leg day. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. So the drama escalated when Taylor stepped outside onto the small overhanging roof. And those behind him saw a claw-like hand reach down and touch his hair. The group screamed and pulled Taylor back while Lucky shot above the overhang and then another similar creature in a nearby tree. It floated to the ground and then scurried into the woods. So they're not floating off into the woods now. They're now scurrying off into the woods. This uh, leaving is very inconsistent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, all over the place of how the re- beings react when they're so the Suttons now moved inside and spent several hours listening for movements, hearing mostly occasional scratches on the roof. The terrified group later described to police what they saw in vivid, frightening terms. The invaders had round, oversized heads and long, and long arms with talons that nearly touched the ground. Everything about them seemed to shimmer and glow in the darkness. Their eyes had yellowish light and their bodies glinted like they were made of silver metal. At 11 p.m., the whole group ran for the cars and hightailed into Hopkinsville Police Station at top speed. One of the investigators checked Lucky's heart rate when they arrived, and it was over 140 beats per minute. What in the world in 1955 would an investigator have a need to check anybody's heart rate? And what did he use to check the heart rate? Did he just do the old uh, two fingers on the wrist and look at your uh, pocket watch or... What are we doing? I mean, do you think he had a stethoscope to tap yeah, into? Yeah, that's why I don't understand. But hey, that's what it was reported. So that's what I what I gave. But uh, so basically, it's allude that they were really panicked. But that could have been from hauling ass high speed at eleven o'clock at night to the police station. So the the Greenwell, which is the police chief Russell Greenwell, he noted that the Suttons weren't the kind of people that would normally run to the police for help. So that, that area, that them, those type of people as they describe or, you know, old country folk that buys people. They kind of handle things themselves. They don't reach out to them specifically for way. So the police chief, the um, local police went to the house and called for backup on the way after the report to uh, take a look at the house and they called for backup and the state police, military police from nearby Fort Campbell and a photographer from the Kentucky New Era arrived. Uh, there, the investigators found shell casings from the gunshots, but no other evidence. Neither could they find proof of heavy drinking. According to the Sutton Monarch, liquor was not allowed in the farmhouse. Once the police and the others left, though, the creatures returned between 2.30 a.m. What they tell the cops, because Billy Joel or Bobby McGee or Elmer is not allowed to have alcohol, according to his parole. Right. (laughs) That's what we all make in the shine. I don't I don't know how to say this without our without really making it sound bad. But my people come from the Eastern Shore. In the panhandle of Florida. So I know a lot of Billy Ray's and Elmer's. So I know I know their number. I guess. So apparently after they came and looked at the farmhouse, they didn't see any evidence other than the gunshots on the ground, some damage to the house. Uh, the team left and the people report that around at 2.30, between 2.30 a.m. and daybreak, Miss Lankford saw, said she saw one of the glowing between 2.30 a.m. and daybreak, Miss Langford said she saw one glowing repeatedly by her bedside window, its claw-like hand on the screen. So she lay there in bed after this whole event happened and just watched this thing stand at the window with its hand on the screen. Like, what the fuck? So you're just going to shoot at them all night and they've come back now after it's all 
calm down and you're not shooting at him any, anymore and you're just going to lay there in bed and watch it stand there with its hand on the window. Like I kind of find that kind of odd, you know, I'd be terrified that they're coming back for revenge or whatever, you know, maybe they're not allowed in the house because she didn't invite them in. Like you have to do for vampires <laughs> yeah, and black eyed children too. <laughs> So, as noted in the Kentucky New Era, the next day, nothing stirred during the investigation. Besides one of the officers accidentally stepping on a cat's tail in the darkness outside the house, no further incitement ensued. So that was added into the report that a, a police officer stepped on a damn cat during the investigation. Like, what happened to small town news? I miss that. All those I facts. love the 1950s news. Or police it's reports important. because they captured everything. A dog yes, barked every last every at last 9 30. 35 p.m. <laughs> so, however, at least one Kentucky police officer believed Taylor and Sutton's story. Sergeant Frank Duddis was not among the officers who visited the farmhouse, the Sutton farmhouse, but he had his own alien encounters. The summer before, Duddis and another officer reported seeing three flying saucers. I think the whole story is entirely plausible, Duddis told them to Kentucky New Era. New Era. I know I saw the saucers. If I saw them, the Kelly story could certainly be true. According to that same article, other officers were reluctant to give their opinions. So what, would, so what could possibly explain what Taylor Sutton and the others had seen? The day after the incident, police investigators returned to the farm, farmhouse searching for evidence of a saucer landing. Footprints, blood trails, or scratch marks on the roof. They found nothing. Bud Ledwith, a local radio station employee, interviewed the adult witnesses and made drawings based on their accounts. According to Davis, he was impressed by the remarkable speci specificity and consistency, even though the men were away from the farmhouse all day, unable to coordinate with the others. So the next day when they were recounting the story to the this radio station employee, they all had pretty much the same story and gave the same account and same description. And, you know, they they he noted that they didn't have a time to coordinate, you know, their stories together, but they had plenty of time before that to do that. I mean, I think it's weren't, a little I was gonna say, weren't they all together? Why Yeah, yeah, that's what it's like to say they didn't have time right before he interviewed them, but even if even if he just showed up out of the blue, I mean they ha they've had all night and the whole evening before really to you know corroborate stories and get it all square. So I don't you know saying they didn't have time to do that before he interviewed them was kind of not you know a fair assessment. So the as I said in the beginning, Project Blue Book. If you're not familiar with Project Blue Book, it was the uh, government, air, or, well, government, United States Air Force investigating team for UFOs at the time. Um, before, I might get the uh, the time timeline off a little bit, but it was Project Grudge, Project Sign, and then Project Blue Book eventually took over to investigate um, UFO sightings or you know any kind of abnormalities that involved UFOs. So Glennie Langford's firsthand account of the encounter reported to the Project Blue Book case. We have, I have that, which I will go ahead and pull that up. I'll share it and pull it up and I'll read that for our listeners here. So on Sunday night, August 21st, uh, 1955, about 1030 p.m., I was walking through the hallway, which is located in the middle of my house. I looked out the back door and saw a bright silver object about two and a half feet tall appearing around, appearing round. Oh, I see. I became excited and did not look at it long enough to see it had any eyes or move. I was about 15 or 20 feet from it. I fell backward and then was carried into the bedroom. My two sons, age 25 and his wife, age 29, and his wife uh, and their friends and their wives were all at the house and saw this little man that looked like a monkey. So I'm kind of bouncing all around and, and paraphrasing because it's, it's redacted slightly for whatever reason. At about 3.30 a.m., I was in the bedroom and looked out the north window and I saw a small 
silver shining object about two and a half feet tall that had its hands on the screen looking in. I called for my sons and they shot at it and I left. I was about 60 feet from it this time. I did not see it anymore. I've read the above statement as true to the best of my knowledge on behalf. This was signed by Charles Kirk, First Lieutenant, U.S. Air Force. So this is the account uh, from the matriarch of her, the incident. So it's as bad as vague. So I don't know where a lot of these detail from, because I looked and other than like he said, she said, or, or hearsay kind of stuff, I really didn't see like hundred percent factual stuff of the incident besides like what's in this document. And then the other stuff that I read before, um, there's a little bit more in the aftermath and what's happened since, but for the most part, it's kind of, um, inflated a little bit as the story's been told over and over again in other podcasts and things like that. So while the incident attracted, eventually it attracted the attention of Air Force Project Blue Book, um, documents suggest that its team never officially pursued the matter beyond checking in with the Fort Campbell counterparts who had briefly at the scene the first night. So they were the people, the military police that responded when, the night of the incident. So something I found too that was contradicting is that uh, I, an investigator in 2008 or 2006, he was looking into the incident. He found that it was not military police from the Air Force Base at Fort Campbell. It, it was Army military police from another uh, nearby uh, Army base. So there was a little contradicting um, stuff there. So. Uh, theories about the incident. So the validity of the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter was questioned immediately, of course. Some people doubted the honesty of the Suttons, and neighbors dismissed the whole affair as a drunken debacle and the result of too much moonshine, as Amanda so gladly said earlier. Even police who responded to the scene agreed that it didn't appear that anyone had been drinking. But when the Sutton family tried to profit off interest in the story by charging a mission to the farmhouse, any remaining goodwill took toward them vanished. So they were charging 50 cents to come on the property, a uh, dollar to provide any information, and then $10 to take a photo. So $10. That, that's yeah, a big in, jump. In 1955, that's like a huge jump. And they're not even supplying the camera. They're just letting people take pictures. <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> they started to develop it. Yeah. So, of course, at that point, neighbors grew cold and threatening. And then 10 days later, the Suttons left Kelly for good. So if it wasn't aliens or alcohol, what had happened during the Kelly Hopkinsville incident? So what do you guys think before I go into to what I think it may have been and what the majority kind of thinks it actually was? I think they were hopped up on shrooms or moonshine or both. And one of them was trying to tell the other one to stop doing whatever they were doing. And the lights from the car made it seem like it was crazy. And then they just turned around and that's what happened. Or they were all dreaming. Well, there were circus folk. So true. they could be practicing their own little sideshow. Oh, they weren't circus. They were carnival. That's different though, right? Well, I'm sorry. Car- carnies. Yes. But still, sideshow. True. Could be. Could be. And those are, there's a couple of the, uh, the the other uh, plausible, re, you know what the, what actually happened. One of the main ones, um, and the one that I kind of believe myself, was pushed by many uh, investigators along with a French UFOologist, Renaud Leclet or Leslet, however you pronounce his French name. I don't know. So it involves a creature from the sky. So it kind of jives a little bit but not the alien kind of creature, an owl. To be more specific, a great horned owl. So great horned owl have long wings, glowing eyes, and round heads. Could the people at Sutton Farmhouse mistaken the owl for an alien of the darkness? I absolutely think so. Because you think about the look of a great horned owl, they have those pointy ears and could resemble this next photo, which was drawn um, after speaking with Sutton's about their encounter based on the description's uh, they were given, and I think it's a, a slightly better photo. It's still not, you know, a Van Gogh or anything, but it's a slightly uh, 
slightly better photo. And I think it's actually even more to the story of the Hopkinsville or of the uh, Al thing here. So this one here on the left and see how it's in the one next to it on the right, other than when it's standing up, the laying down, I mean, that could be uh, Al crouched down, you know? But pretty much all these, I, they kind of scream Al to me. Especially the great horned owl with the pointy ears. Well, I just looked it up just out of curiosity to see how tall they are. Wingspan can be like 4.6 feet. So, yeah, it fits. It fits. Absolutely fits. So, I truly think that's what they countered, honestly, is a, a great horned owl. And they just, you know, got freaked out when he was out there, you know, getting the water and, and misled everybody to see mistaken, you know, the great horned owl. The weird part is, well, not so much weird, because think about it. When he said they kind of floated off, it could be when they shot, the owls redirected and went back into the woods for safety. And then when they weren't floating off anymore and they were crawling back, they could have been injured and it wasn't able to fly anymore. So it was scurrying back into the woods as best it can on land. You know, so I definitely uh, can see the, the owl story. So the incident and its ensuing coverage helped to solidify the idea of aliens as little green men in popular culture. Although Taylor and the Suttons described the aliens as little silver men, newspapers ran with little green men instead. That may be because the idea of green aliens had been around since the 1920s and the, with the birth of science fiction. There are those who still don't think the incident was science, fi science fiction, however. There are millions of stars and planets in the universe, said uh, Geraldine Sutton Stythe, the daughter of Lucky Sutton. I can't possibly believe ours is the only planet with life. Today, Stythe is determined that the world hears her family's side of the story. The remaining survivors of the encounter refuse to talk about the incident, so Stythe does it for them. In addition to her books on the encounter, Alien Legacy and the shoot was published in 2007, and the Kelly Green Men Alien Legacy Revisited in 2015, she speaks at Kelly's Little Green Men Days Festival every year. Wait, there's a festival? Yes. So, what? Yeah. Yes. First they off, up. why aren't we going? I, well, that's what I was getting to. It hasn't been, they haven't had one since COVID. After COVID, they kind of stopped doing it and haven't updated their their website since COVID. COVID so fucked COVID, everything. Yes. I think COVID may have killed the Little Green Men Days Festival in Kelly, Kentucky, unfortunately. Another casualty also of COVID. That makes me sad. Thanks a lot for us now being in the darkest timeline. Right. So there's a little, some popular culture that was, that kind of came out of this incident. So prior to this sighting, flying saucer occupants were called little men. Little green men were limited to the science fiction culture. In particular, the Mac Reynolds story, The Case of the Little Green Men, which was written in 1951, or published, or came out. Uh, and Frederick Brown's Martians Go Home, 1955, as well. The day following the alleged sighting, however, local reporters started to call them Little Green Men. And then soon, were soon reproduced into many newspapers, quoted on the radio, and translated into other languages. So that's, like I said you know, a little bit ago, that's where the whole alien and little green men kind of spurred from um, and actually most of the reports now nowadays they kind of refer to them as gray you know little gray men or something like that so it's kind of interesting that um they they originally reported as little gray or silver men the media flipped it to little green men as the media so uh reluctant lovely does with information kind of flips it to the narrative they want to spin um that it went to, you know, green rather than gray. So in the late 1970s, Steven Spielberg used the event as the basis for his Night Skies, a unproduced science fiction horror film. So which also was produced into a TV show in the mid 2000s. Are you guys familiar with that show? Night Skies. It was on TNT, I think. Is TNT still around? Yeah, pretty sure. 
Is it really? I don't have cable. I don't have cable, so. But I do have cable, I do, and it is still around because we watch basketball on it. Yeah. I used to love TNT. They used to have play. It was a lot of reruns. I didn't think they had too many new shows, but I think that was one of their shows that was new and they would play on there. They usually like, I feel like TNT so, like mostly has and, like charmed yeah. and what's that show you guys love that supernatural that I just like, it's too many seasons. I can't commit. Yeah. This is supernatural. Oh, it's on done. TNT oh, it's done. It. So I it's can't done. commit. It's, it's so many episodes. Like you can do it. Like I tried one time to it. commit to, to Grey's Anatomy and I got to episode two and I couldn't do it. Well, that's too many. First off. Yeah. Supernatural is not that many seasons as Grey's Anatomy. I think it is. I think it's like 20 something. I think seasons. it is. It's like Mm-mm. forever. Supernatural? Oh. I'm pretty sure it has like 20 something seasons. You know, now that and I've done the PhD. Now. What? There was only 15. It's oh, it's 15? Like yeah, there was like 20. Yeah, was more, wow. Between 22 and 24 20 episodes. episodes season, yes. I guess now that I've done the PhD, I could okay, that's spend time doing that. Um, side note, Christopher, I'm really pissed it, because I was watching Interview with the Vampire and they took it off HBO. Uh, That's I told you it was going to happen. Fuckers. I told you. It was just like a sample for October. Because the A&E so was mixed with HBO for, for a couple months. And then uh, they have a spinoff of uh, called The Winchesters that comes on um, HBO, I think. Is that from that? Oh, I like yeah, that show. Supernatural, yeah. yeah it's you spin-off. like that it's, show, but you haven't seen Supernatural? Yeah, you make no sense to me sometimes. It's the, it's the parents of the protagonists in Supernatural. Or the protagonists in this show. It's Winchester. not that I don't want to watch Supernatural. I just, the commitment. But I guess I have some time now. So I want to get the tattoo from that show. You see that with the V and the C intertwined and the dots. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, so the 1986 comedy horror film Critters is loosely based on the event uh-huh, as well. Which I don't rem- do you remember that? I feel like I yeah. remember, but I can't I picture it. I, I remember, remember the that. title, but I can't remember like any of the details from the movie. So the Pokemon Sableye introduced in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire is based on the goblins described in the Hopkinsville event. In the games, they are animated with a swaying or waiting motion based on the creature's reported gait, which is interesting. I didn't know that either. I can't picture that uh, Pokemon, but apparently he's or they are based off of that as well. Very interesting. Yeah. Pokemon save. I'm just looking real quick. So I'm curious now. He's purple, though. Fucking internet. Fuck. Oh, yeah. He is. Oh, yeah, he is. But he does look like the drawings, though. And apparently, he walks with the reported gait that the uh, goblins have. So, in the Pathfire, I, and I have no idea about this because I'm not into the whole uh, role playing games, but apparently, the game, role playing game called Pathfinder, the Hobkins, a type of gremlin from the Bestiary Five book, is based upon the goblins described in the events as well, which kind of makes sense and interesting that they called them Hobkins because it almost sounds like Hopkins. So, the event was also the basis for the Annoyance Theater's musical. It came from Kentucky in Chicago. So apparently in Chicago, they had a theater musical called It Came From Kentucky, which is also based off the Hopkinsville event. Uh, A February 2020 episode of the American television series Project Blue Book also focused on the event. That was a good show. And I wish I loved one of the main characters in that show. He's been in a lot of other stuff. And I thought they were going to continue it because it, it felt like it ended open, you know, it was open-ended. 
and they never did anything with it. I was kind of sad. And it was a really popular show. You remember that on it was on um, History Channel, and it was like a uh, like a series type thing. It wasn't a documentary. I never like seen it history. or heard of it. Really, it's good. Oh, it's that I, got um, what's this? Littlefinger. Yeah, Littlefinger. Yeah. Game of Thrones. And he's a he's a fantastic actor, and he he was he was the main. One of the he's he plays um shit. Alan Heineck? Heineck. Heineck, yeah. Which is a he he were he was actually in Project Blue Book, obviously from the show, but he became a big time UFOlogist towards the end of his career. Uh and he actually helped Steven Spielberg on the set of uh Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So Brings it to the end. So more than 50 years after the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, the truth about what had happened is more elusive than ever. But that has not stopped people people from wondering and celebrating what might have happened on that hot August night. So another drawing that I that we missed in the beginning and we'll post it on the, the uh, Instagrams is the uh, craft that our friend uh, Billy Ray saw outside why he was fetching a pail of water with the rainbows. Of course, it's not in color like I would love it to be, but here is a, a, a sketch that was drawn um, during the Project Blue Book case. And you guys can't see it. I'm not sharing the fucking screen. There you go. So that is the spaceship that. Ledwith drew from Taylor's description. So they were throwing her on a frisbee outside, is what I'm seeing. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly what it looks like. It is probably I could probably draw that, and I can't draw the same. Or a hubcap as a frisbee. Yes, they were playing frisbee with the hubcap. It's exactly. I thought it looked like a pita, like a nice warm pita coming out of the oven. Oh yeah, and somebody tossing it to somebody yeah. eating some nice Mediterranean food. Love yeah, it. Yeah, that's where my mind went. Apparently I'm hungry because all I'm talking about is food right now. Well, huh. that is brings us to the end, my friends. That is the Hopkinsville encounter. Well, thanks for sharing that, Chris. I actually enjoyed learning about some hillbillies. I mean some aliens. And yeah. uh, I not did not know that's where they came from. Not my favorite uh, UFO case. And it's kind of spotty and, and jumps all around with the recounting of the events. Um, and I, I never realized that because I've heard a ton of podcasts and a ton of other things on it. And I just didn't fi- want to like, I mean, give information like they did on that count that was kind of not contradicting and factual uh, I don't know I just to me the a lot of it was kind of it seemed filled in and, and Hollywood had, you know like fluffed mm-hmm. more than it, more than the story already seemed but yeah and that the lady the, the Stice, Stice lady she she was I mean she's in it, documentaries and, and does all kinds of stuff I mean I'm just saying she speaks at at the the Hopkinsville thing or the Kelly thing every year and writing those two books is nothing. I mean, she does any documentary that anybody asks her to do. She's on there, you know, talking about aliens. She's like hardcore in the UFO stuff. So, but yeah, that's it. That's all I have. I love it. All right, friends. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us on this episode and uh, like I said we're going to continue to kick them out and hopefully have some guests on that want to join us and have some laughs with us and get us you know just having a chat if uh, anybody has any suggestions on any topics as we beg and plead please reach out to us let us know get a hold of us uh, smoke signals whatever you got to do um, the biggest thing that helps us is the, the the word of mouth, telling your friends, your family, whoever you want to tell about the podcast. Come give us a listen. Give us a chance. 
Um, we're, we're, we'd love to try to win your hearts and minds. Um, share the podcast as well. Get on the social medias. Share the episode if it's if it's one you like. Share, comment on it. Tell your friends that way. Um, give us, please, please, please leave us a review. If you like what we're doing, help us get through it. Get to do it. And uh, leave us a five-star review on our podcast platform of choice. You can reach us at our email at the waters run podcast at gmail.com as well as our Instagram at TWRD underscore podcast and offer still stands. Leave us a five-star review and we'll shoot you out some stickers. I did see a five-star review on there that I don't know who the person is. Um, then I didn't see a name on there. It was anonymous. It looked like, um, if we owe you a sticker, please reach out to us and let us know. I'd be happy to send those out to you. Was it recent? Uh, fairly recent. Yeah, it was fairly recent. I happened to jump on there cause it, it used to notify me. So I thought, cause we hadn't been putting any episodes out like, you know, we were. So I thought, you know, there wasn't an activity and there's not many reviews on there, unfortunately, but, uh, it would notify me when we did get reviews and it didn't when this one came through i didn't get notified so um i guess maybe because it was anonymous or it, it, it just didn't show a name and i couldn't get it to show me a name so i wanted to reach out to the person to see if they wanted some stickers but they said a very nice it was on apple Podcasts. i haven't gone on uh the the spotify or any other channel so if you have left the review on there just reach out to us. Let you know. Just hit us on on uh, email or on Instagram and leave us a line and say, "Hey, where are my stickers?" And we'll we'll get them to you. I'd be happy to send you some. That's all. So, I thank you guys. And until Thanks, next time, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks.